The Norman conquest of England in 1066 changed the course of British history forever. The impact of the arrival of the Normans can still be seen today, in our language, our laws, and in our landscape. But one thing that the Normans brought across is often overlooked, and in fact has become such a quintessential part of the British countryside that many people, myself included, would be forgiven for thinking that they had been here all along. Hello and welcome. My name's Philip and today I'm going to be talking about rabbits. Yes, rabbits. Whether as food, fur or fluffy friend, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these long-eared lagomorphs. But what exactly have the Normans got to do with rabbits? Well, as I mentioned in my introduction, it was actually the Normans who brought rabbits across to Britain. And yet, in the last 900 years, they've become an established part of our culture and our countryside. But let's start back at the beginning. So where are rabbits from? Well, for the sake of this video, we're talking about the European rabbit, Oryctolagus cuniculus, also known as the coney. And their native home is the Iberian Peninsula, the westernmost part of Europe where you would find Portugal, Spain, Andorra, and the south of France. Neither the Romans nor the Greeks actually had a word for rabbits, since they weren't native to Italy or Greece. And so, when talking about Iberia, they do sometimes use the term small burrowing hare, as hares were much more common at the time. It was the first century Roman poet Catullus who came up with the name Cuniculus having simply Latinized a local name for the animal. And it was the Romans who helped the rabbit spread throughout mainland Europe, but it never seemed to make it across to Britain. There was a single rabbit bone from the Viking period found in the city of York, but considering it was just the one bone, it is more likely to have been the remains of some seafaring traveler's lunch. No living rabbits had yet set foot on these shores. Skip ahead to December 1066, and William the Conqueror had been declared King of England. At this point there had been no allusions to rabbits in any British literature, and in fact so it would remain for at least a few decades. Back in Europe, by this period rabbits were being farmed for food and fur, and so were kept in warrens but there are no mentions of warrens in England in the Doomsday Book of 1086, or any other documents of the 11th century. The first real evidence of rabbits in Britain came from an excavation of Rayleigh Mount in Essex. This mound was once the site of a Norman Mott and Bailey castle, and it was here that archaeologists found rabbit bones in a midden, basically a big rubbish pit dating from the 12th century. Through the 12th and 13th centuries, rabbit farming became much more common in England and Ireland, with rabbit often being served at feasts. The wild population remained quite low, however, as outside of warrens they were easily hunted by humans and native predators. A population boom came in the 18th century, when changes to farming practices and a crackdown on local predators finally gave rabbits the chance they needed. Rabbits, as well as being fluffy, cute, and um, delicious, are famous for being what's called an invasive species. An invasive species is an organism which negatively alters environments that it finds itself in. Basically, it's a creature that changes the environment it is introduced to, and those changes are detrimental to things already living there. The invasive nature of rabbits was recorded in the 1st century BC, following the Roman conquest of the Balearic Islands. 
The rabbits they had brought with them, when allowed to run free, caused famines by eating all the crops, and even caused houses to collapse by burrowing underneath them. The inhabitants of the islands had to petition the emperor for help, and he sent a legion of troops armed with ferrets to cull the rabbits. More recently, there was the rather infamous release of European rabbits in Australia, the effects of which Australians are still struggling with today. The reason that rabbits are such an invasive species is that they thrive in farmland, and if they don't have any natural predators, they breed like, well, rabbits. On that note, let's talk about medieval symbolism and rabbits. Unfortunately, there's surprisingly little. It appears that for most of the medieval period, rabbits were simply considered food by the wealthy and a pest by everybody else. In Jewish folklore, the rabbit is an unclean animal, and often symbolised cowardice. And this seemed to have coloured people's opinions of the rabbit well into the medieval period as well. The popular image of rabbits and hares as symbols of fertility wasn't really around in the medieval period, or rather, if it was, not quite in the way that you might imagine it nowadays. When rabbits do make appearances in medieval art, they're often actually used to symbolise the Virgin Mary. And this is because of a phenomenon called superfetation, which has been observed in rabbits and hares. This is a rare condition where fetuses are developing at different stages within the uterus, resulting in rabbits and hares occasionally seeming to give birth without having been impregnated. And it's recorded as early as the first century by Pliny the Elder, who speculated that hares could somehow impregnate themselves. It comes as no surprise then that these animals, and white rabbits in particular, became associated with the Holy Virgin. In fact, it was this Christian symbolism of rabbits that was being referenced by German Lutherans in the 17th century when they created De Osterhase, or as you might know them nowadays, the Easter Bunny. De Osterhase was a Christian symbol who judged children's behaviour and rewarded the good ones with treats and gifts, a lot like Santa Claus. And just like Santa Claus, over time he became a sort of mascot for the holiday and began to lose the overtly religious overtones. Unlike Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny's Christian roots are not as well known nowadays, and that's mostly the fault of German folklorist Jacob Grimm, who, in his 1835 work Deutsche Mythology, stated, The Easter hare is unintelligible to me, but probably the hare was the sacred animal of Astara. This claim was repeated by other authors until, by the 1960s, it was being stated as fact. Thing is, to quote the Oxford Dictionary of English Folklore, there is no shred of evidence that hares or rabbits were associated with Eosta, the Germanic deity which Grimm called Ostara. In fact, we only know about Eosta's existence because of the Venerable Bede, and he does not associate her with any animal. Finally, I ought to mention the rather odd motif of medieval marginalia, of rabbits running around with weapons, attacking monks and causing all sorts of mischief. Now, if there was some deep symbolic meaning to these vignettes, it has been lost to time. It was often monks who were writing the manuscripts, so perhaps they held a grudge against these creatures that they saw as mischievous pests digging up their gardens. In a lot of other cases, though, it may just have been that they were supposed to be funny. Rabbits and hares were the quintessential prey animal of the medieval period, and pretty much every serious image of them involves them being hunted or captured. 
What a fun piece of subversive humour to have these creatures causing so much havoc. The Smithfield Decretals of the late 13th century play the joke out in full, with the rabbits arresting, trying, and executing a dog that had been hunting them. It's exactly the same kind of humour as the terrifying Beast of Kerbanog from Monty Python. Rabbits are cute, fluffy, and innocent, and sometimes it's really funny when they go on a murderous rampage. Thanks for watching. Farewell. Hey everyone, thank you again so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed our video about rabbits. If you know any rabbits that might be trying to murder you, make sure to like and subscribe, and then contact the authorities. Hopefully, I'll see you in the next video. Farewell.